thanks everyone for attending our topic. Today we're going to be talking about cyanogen themes, your phone, your canvas. So we have three speakers here today, obviously. Um, so I'm Michelle, the Senior Product Manager for Themes. Um, before that, I actually was working at Xiaomi, also working a bit around themes and helping the company expand abroad. Um, we have Clark, who officially has been hacking on Android since the release of the G1. Prior to Cyanogen, he worked on Chameleon OS, which is a Cyanogen mod-based ROM, which supports the UI themes unofficially. He is our theme wizard. And then we have Dave, who is the product designer in our team. And he, prior to that, he was working in uh, Cove Dev. Unofficially, he's actually our in-house theme design guru. And one we haven't added, we have over there Andy. He's one of the original members of Themes. He works on our theme store and a lot of service stuff. But he actually built out the theme store, too. So yeah, he's right over there. OK. So we have one of the most awesome teams. Um, but we're here today to talk about themes and personalization. So, what are, so we're going to talk about what are themes, how themes work, designing themes, and we're going to preview one of our next big things we're, we've been working on. So what are themes? At Cyanogen, we believe you should be able to make your phone as unique as you are. After all, everyone's different. Everyone has their own style, their own passions, their own interest. So theme was a solution to this. It allows the end user to easily change the look and feel of their device. Um, you have the ability to change out the lock screen, boot animation, icons, fonts, ringtones, pretty much anything, you name it. So we actually take themes quite seriously, and we're glad the media also recognizes it as well. Um, we're actually going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the theme products. So for the end users, we have Theme Store, Theme Chooser, and App Themer. For developers, we have the Theme Studio. The Theme Store houses Cyanogen themes. It streamlines the discovery process and optimizes search results um, so that you can easily search just icons, controls, wallpapers, and fonts. All of the content in the store is all created by the community. The theme store offers users a deeper level of customization. So users can select a theme, separate it into components, then swap the components with another theme. So like mix and match, so to speak. This allows the users to create endless combinations of themes that is completely unique to the individual. Then we have App Themer, which takes it even further. So this allows the end user to just customize one app, and the rest of the device remains in its original theme. Lastly, we have the Theme Studio. It's a platform where theme developers can upload their theme to the store, and it allows them to track the downloads and manage their theme. So the products I just talked about, um, this is like a framework that ties everything in. Um, let's start off. So it starts off, if you can see here, on the Theme Studio end, um, where the developer, theme developers publish their, uh, upload their theme, then it gets published onto the Theme Store, where then it gets uh, selected by the end user, um, and then it gets applied, and Clark will talk a little bit more specifically in detail about that. So the theme store, actually, we've launched it about a little less than a year ago. Um, and I want to share with you some general statistics. Majority of the themes right now we have um, are all paid. So about 85% are paid and 15 are free. Um, it's all community driven. 
and we have about a 5.5% weekly growth rate. So which components do users like to customize? Um, we have a lot of different components, and a lot of people actually tend to think wallpapers might be the most often that people like to customize, but surprisingly, it's actually boot animation and font, I mean fonts is actually the most popular, followed by icons and then it's boot animation. Okay, now I'll pass it to Clark to explain how themes work. You guys hear me okay? All right. So, being an engineer, I like to know how things work. So any, any engineers out here right now, software engineers, any? any? All right, well, we've got a couple. So hopefully, guys, I'm here to at least explain a little bit how Themes works on the backside in our framework. So let's get started. How exactly does a theme work? When you actually are using a theme, how does, what happens in the back end that actually makes it change the visual look and feel? Well, as my boy Shia would say, it's magic. While I would love to say this, because that would be the easy way out, I'm not going to do that. So let's take a look at it a little bit. So we leverage a thing called the Runtime Resource Overlay, or RO for short. This was something that introduced by Sony a couple years ago, and it's actually an AOSP right now. So we, Andy Mast, actually, I'm going to put him on the spot again. This guy started the foundation before I started here, so he actually started working on the RO before I ever had a chance. Um, but we leveraged something that's already an AOSP. It made sense, right? We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we took that and went a little step further to make it work with our theme engine. So what does RO do? Well, it replaces resources at runtime, hence the name. So it does that by mapping resources from a theme to the application. So whenever we want to get a, a resource from an application, it'll find the theme version and give that back to us. And so this magic is really happening down at the native layer where doing this is in the order of microseconds. So we can fetch these themed resources really quick so we don't see an impact um, to the user. So to understand what's going on here, we have to have a little background of what resources are. So uh, what are resources in an application? They're not these resources, sorry. Got the wrong side. What they are, resources are just assets the application can access. Besides the code, it's got access to things like what are called drawables. These can be bitmaps. They can be vector drawables, which were introduced in Lollipop. They can be shapes, um, color drawables. There's a plethora of drawables that are accessible to an application. And themes can also interchange these drawables. So it can be a lot more flexible. If a drawable was a bitmap, we can turn it into a vector drawable. We can turn it into an animated drawable. So it becomes something much more than it originally was. Um, there's layouts. Layouts define the UI to the, for the application. So this tells where the views are in the, in the layout, where buttons are, and stuff like that. Um, there's XML, which is usually just generic XML that's specific to the application. There's no set format for it. It usually can define certain information, maybe states or configs and stuff like that specific to an application. Um, and then some of the meat and potatoes is in a, an area called values. These are XML, which define various types of values, like arrays, colors, um, dimensions that can be used for padding, uh, text size, and stuff like that. The strings, the text that you see on your buttons and in the UI is usually defined in this XML uh, values as well as styles. Now, styles is basically think of it as a collection of attributes that determine how a theme or how an application looks or a UI element looks. So we, we've got this thing called a bag that just takes all these attributes, puts them together, and then uh, displays those to the user. So while we have access to all these resources, there's a few that we do not allow to theme, and there's a good reason for that. Um, layouts we don't allow to theme because applications update all the time. And if an application gets updated and they add a new view or they change their layout, if we theme that, they're going to now try to get that part of the UI that's not there now because it's been themed and they're going to, the app's going to crash. So it looks bad and usually the user doesn't see the theme as the culprit, they see the, applica uh, the app as the culprit. So we don't want application developers to be blamed for stuff that our theme engine could be doing. So that's off limits. XML just doesn't make sense because that's generic to the application, or specific to the application, so there's no need to do that. Arrays, arrays are usually a collection of values and those values can be uh, other resources like colors, so those can be themed elsewhere, so we don't touch arrays. Um, we don't touch things like booleans, because booleans can change values, true or false, and a theme could potentially enable something the developer didn't want enabled, because they were using a boolean value. Um, and then strings. Strings 
we shouldn't be changing text anyways. I mean, a, an app, a theme could be malicious and maybe fish and change text. And they change the icon of an app and now they change the text to make it look like a banking app or something like that. And then there's a whole aspect of translations and locales. I mean, if you theme a string, you're basically going to have to provide all the translations for it too. And it's just poor user experience. So those, those types of things are off limits. So now that we understand what resources are, um, there's a couple ways that an application actually asks, accesses these resources. Um, one of those is via XML. So here I've got an example. This is actually a vector drawable that was introduced in Lollipop. Um, this one happens to be of our CyanogenMod mod mascot, Sid. And if you look here in the red, there's a reference here called at color cyan. That's a color we defined elsewhere in our application. It's one of those resources. And so now, whenever this icon's drawn, it's going to fetch that color and it's going to be drawn in that. Now, a theme could now change that color, and so Sid could be, instead of cyan, he's now purple or maybe pink. You know, it depends on what the themer wants. Uh, the other way we can access resources is via code. So an application developer might want to access certain uh, resources. So they can do that. One important thing is they need to import this r.java class. So Java has, um, to let Java know of what classes and stuff you're going to be using in your code, you have to import it. So this is a specific class that gets generated at build time for the developer. Um, so a lot of this is extracted to them. They don't really see what's going on under the hood. So I'm actually going to provide a little details for that for you. But um, in this case, we're trying to get a string and a drawable via code. And we're accessing them using that r.class. And for strings, we're using r.string. And for drawables, we're using r.drawable. So it's an easy way to get those resources um, both in XML and to the application in code. Uh, so now we're going to talk about resource IDs. And we did have a problem here earlier getting access, but SIDS is helping us out. So we've got our ID. We can get past this now. So resource IDs. This is the meat and potatoes of how resources are provided to an application at runtime. Now, as I mentioned, these resource IDs are generated at build time from a tool called AAPT. And that's um, Android Asset Packaging Tool. This tool will take look at your resources, generate the r.java for you so you can access that via code. And it also creates this thing called a resource table that has all those IDs stored in it in a format that it can quickly access at runtime. So it's a very efficient system. Um, the resource IDs are unique to the application, but they're not always the same IDs across different applications. It can vary. Um, so a resource ID, it's just an integer. It's a value that tells the system a few bits of information. Uh, the first one on the left is the package ID. Now, Android's got this concept of package, packages for resources. Every application gets the Android framework resources, which is package ID 1. Um, application, third-party apps, end up getting a 7F, which is at the bottom of the spectrum. And then everything in between, there's libraries and other types of resources that can be loaded in with their own resource ID that get tagged on. So you got a package ID that tells the system, OK, which, groups are, which group am I going to grab this resource from? Now the next value is a resource type. This is a value that was generated at runtime as well that says, OK, it's a drawable, it's an integer, it's a string, it's whatever. This, this number tells it exactly where to go in this table. And then last, once it's found that area where those types are, it's got an entry index. And that just tells it really quickly where to go in memory to fetch that resource for you. So using these three values, it can quickly grab a resource at runtime and bring it right back to the application to be used, whether it's in layouts, code. So OK, we've got resource IDs. We've got resources. Now how do we get the theme to mix to work with all this, right? So there's a tool called IDMap. This is uh, built in with Android system. It's a binary that runs at, uh, when the app's installed, when the theme's installed. And basically what it does is it creates a mapping from the application to resources that map it to that one in the theme. So it's using those resource IDs. It basically goes through the theme, looks at all the different resources it has. And first it, ha it looks at the type. OK, the type needs to match. So a drawable needs to match to a drawable, a string to a string, so forth. You can't mix and match. You can't have a dimension being mapped to a color. So that stuff, that's the first constraint. The second one is the name of those resources have to match. So before you saw in my example, I had like my app icon and stuff like that. So those names need to match. And once it finds that matching between those two values, it'll say, OK, the application's resource ID is this. The theme's resources ID is this. So now it knows that whenever I ask for this guy, it can just point directly to this one and fetch that resource instead of the original application. And the way this is stored, it's in a, just like the resource table, it's in an efficient structure where we can quickly grab these mappings and be able to fetch the resource um, as if it was never themed. I mean, it, it's, it's really quick. So how does this work once we've got all this in place? All right, so our application is going to say, hey, I want to get this drawable called app icon. Okay, so we ask the system, hey, can you fetch me this drawable? 
So it goes down and there's a thing called an asset manager and it will actually try to grab that resource for you. It's taken that ID that we've provided to it. And it's going to say, okay, which package is it in? It's in 7F, all right. We're going to look it up. All right, we find the resource. But we see that it's got an ID map to it. So what do we do? Well, we're now going to point to the themes resource table. And ultimately, the theme is going to be, the system is going to return the themed resource. So even though we were asking for this app icon, what we get back is the themed version, which happens to be this foo.png. So we've got everything in place. We've got these resources being mapped and stuff. So what's it look like once we start doing this? Um, on the left here, we've got the quick setting tiles from Lollipop. This is what everybody's used to seeing, like an AOSP. This is the standard look and feel. But let's apply one theme. So we've got the same thing. we still got our quick setting tiles. Nothing changed there, but now we've got some different look. We've got some different color, some different iconography. Um, even some of the dimensions can change within there just to give it a better, uh, different look and feel for, for that particular user. And if we do it one more time, once again, everything's still laid out the same way, but we get a visually different look. So if the demo gods are going to play nicely with me, I'm going to actually just uh, show you guys real time a couple theme changes. So you can just see that we are doing this runtime, and it's really quick. Sorry, it's, see that for the most part. So I'm going to go from our settings application, we can go right to our theme chooser. Uh, and like Michelle said, we can mix and match themes. Uh, so we're not, we don't have to apply a theme wholesale. So right now, here's what my status bar looks like. And the uh, quick settings drawer. So I'm just going to change my system UI. I'm going to go to one of our other themes here called Hexo. And I'm just going to hit apply. And now I've got a different look and feel there. Um, another cool thing that I love to play with is our app themer, so I'm going to use this instead. So we're in settings. I just want to change settings. I don't want to change anything else. And this is where app themer is really awesome for that. Now that I'm in settings, I can click on this little fab up here and I get a button. So let's go back to system. So there you see we're right back at the system theme, just like that runtime. Don't like that. Here's our new Zuck Z1 theme. So again, it's settings, but visually, it's slightly different. You can see that we can change a lot of the elements to give you a look and feel. And, but we're not reorganizing stuff, because like I said, we don't change the layout. So the user's still going to be con comfortable with the UI. They just get a different look and feel. They make it their own. And that's what Themes is all about. So now that we see how Themes works, and we know how to apply a theme and see how it goes, Cover here is going to let you guys know how to make a theme and actually get it published. All right, so uh, Clark just told you about how uh, themes actually work, and now we're going to talk about how to design themes. So what goes into a theme? We have nine different components that you're able to include inside a theme on Cyanogen. So we have lock screen, boot animation, notifications, ringtones, alarms, fonts, overlays, icons, and wallpapers. Some of those are really simple swaps where it's one-to-one. -one. So something like the lock screen. Right now, we currently allow you to change the wallpaper on a lock screen. So it's as simple as including a new wallpaper within the theme, and when the user applies the theme, you'll have that wallpaper. That same type of one-to-one -one swap happens with the boot animation, notification sound, ringtone sound, alarms. Fonts, it can get a little fun. So you can include a completely different font and have that work throughout the system. But the cool thing about fonts now is that you can actually change the font per weight. So if for your bold characters, you might want to have like a different font, you can do that. You can include a font and have that one called out specifically. Maybe for italics, you want to get like a nice script font, you could have that too. So you could have that kind of diversity within the system that will work throughout the entirety. So if an app says, hey, I want you know, this italic weight, it'll, your font will be provided there. So that's a really cool thing that we offer. Um, of all of these components, the ones that have the biggest visual impact for users are the overlays, the icons, and the wallpapers. So wallpaper is pretty simple, just like the lock screen. If you include a wallpaper within your theme, it'll work. And actually, in our latest 12.1 release of Cyanogen OS, you can actually include multiple wallpapers now that a user will be able to choose through in the theme chooser that we saw earlier. So let's talk about icons. Now, we all know that's how we have to interact with the applications on our device. If you want to get into Twitter, you got to click that icon. You want to get into Facebook, you click the icon. So that's a really big piece of the visual landscape when a user is interacting on your device. So with themes, you can actually create unique icon sets that work to match the rest of the look and feel that you're going. And it's literally, you know, however your imagination wants to be, you can sit there and go and create just a whole different look for each one and craft each one individually to have that unique feel. 
Now, let's say you don't want to have to make a thousand icons because that's just a lot of work. We offer the ability to compose icons using a couple images and they'll be able to cover a limitless, unlimited amount, sorry, of icons. So what you see here is essentially a sandwich of layers, right? So we start at the bottom with our little backplate down here. And what happens is you can create this backplate and that's going to be the first thing that gets put into the canvas. The next thing you're going to see would be the icon that is provided by the separate application. So again, like Facebook, that's the icon from Facebook. And then you can create this masking layer. So what a mask does is it allows you to essentially create uh, a space that you only want to show. So if you wanted like a star, you could create the star and the star inside is the only bit that's going to show and then it's like you scissor out the rest of it. So for in this one it looks like a fingerprint and that's what's going to see and I'll show you that in a second. And then on the top bit would be an overlay. So maybe you could do something like you want to create like a, a diver's helmet. So you could have the background of the diver's helmet, have that ink icon on the center part, and then you could actually stamp the visor over it and have this kind of glassy look that would cover the top of it, giving you this really cool look. So you've made all of those layers. How do those work? It's really, really simple. Within the icons component, there's a file called the app filter. And with just these four lines right here, we can create this system where we have the icon backplate that we made earlier, the mask, as well as the overlay. And then there's an additional attribute called the scale factor. So you can actually scale the stock icons up or down to fit your needs. So if you want them to be up to fill out the space that you're going to be cutting out with the mask, you can scale them up a bit like we've done here to make sure that some of the edges are not still within the masking. So what would that look like on device? Well, those layers that we just had two slides ago, this is what they look like when they get composed together. So for four images, you're able to get a unique icon set that will scale up to however many apps that a user has installed on their device. So it's just a really simple way to get maximum coverage and still have like a themed look on your device. So we've talked about icons. Let's talk about overlays. What's an overlay? Well, so for every package on the user's device, there's going to be uh, resources that are specific to that package. So the theme is able to break these down. So you'll have your tree structure, which will have the assets, your overlays, and then you're going to be able to call out. So every, every app has a package name. So if it was you know, the system UI, which is your pull down bars, com android uh, dot system UI, and the same thing for the phone and for settings. Each one of those is going to be a separate overlay directory where you'll be able to house the specific resources for that one. So we'll dive into that just a little further right now. But I want to talk about common first. Now, common is a unique uh, feature to our theme engine that allows you to have a central location that's accessible to all of the other uh, application overlays within the theme. So if you're going to be using a single color throughout your theme, maybe you want to make a blue theme, what you can do is you can include the blue color within your common overlay and then reference that value in all of the other ones. So instead of having to say like your hex code is, you know, whatever it is, you don't have to put that in every specific overlay. You can put it in one location and then tweak that in the future. So, you know, you've been working on this for a couple weeks and you realize that that blue is just not saturated right. So all you have to do is update in the one location and it'll populate throughout the rest of the theme and you won't have to worry about it after that. And again, this common folder is magical. It works with everything, drawable, styles, colors, dimensions. You can put anything that the theme engine can cover, you can put in there, and that's going to allow you to save space in your theme because you're not going to have to duplicate the same thing over and over. So let's look at how an overlay uh, might get put together. So here we have uh, settings. So what are some of the items on here? Well, we have the action bar. In particular, this action bar is actually going to be controlled by a style within the app. So we look here. And so a big part of creating a theme is actually having to dive in and look how each uh, application is made up. And uh, luckily enough, uh, most of the sources available right on GitHub, so you can go in and see how settings is made, how dialer is made, and so forth. So for this one, for the action bar, to theme this one, what we're going to do is the pre-existing style, theme.actionbar, is part of the settings. Because we want to have a reusable action bar that we can use in some other different styles, we're actually going to create our own style called Sinjin.ActionBar, and that's going to allow us to cover all the different visual aspects of this. So we'll be able to change the background. Uh, normally, this is an elevated action bar, but you can set that elevation value to zero and be able to get that back down on the same plane as the rest of the settings, and so forth. And you'll even see we make use of the uh, common styles over here 
So that's for the text right up here. We actually have that put in the comments. So if I want to go into like the messaging app, I can reference that same style and I'll know that my title text is going to be the same across every single app that I'm theming. What are some other aspects that we can do? Well, so we have all of these icons right here. So in this case, these are actually vector drawables and we have those. So each one of these is going to be a file that has all of the point data that makes up the shape. And you'll, again, you'll see that we actually have that comment folder again. So we have a color. So each one of these is going to be using a color and we just reference that in the comment folder. And again, so if you don't like the way that green looks anymore, you can change it one time and it's going to work in all of those files. So you don't have to go through, you know, 30 different image vector drawables and be like, oh, I didn't like that one. Let me change the hex code again. Nope. Nice and easy and simple with the comment folder. What are some other things? Well, let's look at how this is really composed. So this entire screen is going to be using this style called theme.settingsbase. There's a lot of different things here, so I know it looks a little, but once you start doing a lot, it actually starts to make sense. So there's different effects that you can control, like the uh, color background, right? So I'm pointing that to a common value, theme background, so that way in every app I can make my background color the same because, again, I'm using that common folder. I think you're going to start to see the theme here. Same thing with everything else, like the theme edge. So that's like when you do the over scroll, it does like a little bit of a color. That's something you can also control. It's a pretty much every aspect on the screen is tweakable within a theme and you can really create this custom look that just really just is different. So there's some other stuff too. We've been talking about colors. What about dimensions? So you can do things like the elevation. So normally in the lollipop theme, the, all of those uh, categories are actually lifted up as cards, but for this one we've actually set those against the background. So we did that by changing the elevation value. There's other things like padding and margins, and you just tweak each one just a little bit and it allows you to get this different look. So we go from this look back to the stock and then back to what we just did. So you can see it's actually really different. You can see we compressed each of the line items. You know, we've got different colors. All the spacing is different. And it really gives you just this unique look that you're able to achieve that you can, you know, if you don't like it anymore, you can turn it off and you don't have to, you know, run any, like a new ROM. You don't have to, like, reset any settings. It's easy as just switching it off. And so sometimes, there's going to be some cross-pollination when it comes to elements that are something you have to theme. So in this instance, majority of what's on the screen is going to be within the settings app. But there are a few things, such as these switches and that search icon, which aren't going to be within the settings app. For something like that, you're going to also have to theme framework, because controls like radio buttons, checkboxes, all originate within the Android framework. So you don't always get to do just one overlay to get the whole entire look. Sometimes you're going to have to go outside the box and say, oh, well, I also have frameworks. So you need to consider how it's going to look in all of the different ones that you are theming. So that was just really like a big brief overview of what goes into creating a theme. There's a ton of styles and colors and values that are out there for you to tweak. And it's really just about diving in and seeing all those. So here's a couple things to keep in mind should you want to get uh, started and do this. You want to try to reuse your styles and colors via that common folder. Again, this is unique to our theme engine and it's really useful for making sure that you don't have to do more work in the future when it comes to tweaking things. And this even allows you to create variants of a theme. Maybe you want to do a red version. You really liked it. So if you set everything up correctly using this common folder, you can just go in, tweak everything within there and have like a different color available just like that. Vector drawables. These were re recently introduced with uh, Lollipop API 21, and they are fantastic. Uh, if you're not familiar with how uh, Android handles different resolutions, it creates these different buckets. So you'll have like drawable HDPI, that'll be for like an HD screen. You'll have drawable double X HDPI, that'll be for like a QHD. And so what vector drawables do, they allow you to create a single image that you place in drawable, and that's going to scale up and down based on your resolution needs, allowing you to create only one drawable and then have it look like pixel perfect on every device. Otherwise, you're going to have to sit there and make each version if you want it to look good. You could opt to go for a larger one and have it scaled down, but this will give you the, the most crisp results. Framework styles. Now, I did mention that you have to do some things in framework. Your controls, there's no other way to do that. But there are styles in framework, such as like theme.material, theme.materialite. You don't want to mess with those because those can cause conflicts in apps that you're not specifically theming. So maybe you had settings, which was using theme material light, and you're like, oh, I want this text to be white here, and you go and change it in the framework. 
what will happen is you may get like a Reddit app that's also using that, and then you're going to end up with white text on a white background, and that's not going to look good for the user. So you want to try to avoid messing with the framework styles and handle everything within an app. You can still point to those framework styles, but you want to make sure that you're doing most of your edits within each one, so that way you don't do any, th any conflicts with apps that you're not specifically covering. And if anybody's an app developer out there, you can help themers by not putting your resources with directly within a layout. So if you have a text view, don't just put a hex color right there inside your layout file or point to like uh, a framework color that you don't want them to change. Point it into a colors XML or dimensions or something like that because otherwise themers can't touch it and that's, that makes everybody sad. So seriously, keep it out of layouts. But, so yeah, so that's pretty much a basic overview of themes. There's a lot to dive into and see, and basically the best way to get started is just to dive in. So we have a template available on GitHub. That's github.com, Syngin, Android Packages Themes Template. Uh, you can, if you just search Syngin Theme Template, it'll come up in Google search first for result. Uh, but yeah, that's it. I'm gonna turn it over to Clark, who's going to tell you about the next big thing coming to Syngin OS. Those of you that are here, just want to say, this is the first time that we're showing this publicly, so you guys are privy to something that hasn't been seen outside of Cyanogen, our offices itself. So I'm really excited. I'm humbled to be able to be the one to present this because I, I love this feature. It's really cool. I hope you guys are going to feel the same. So let me just go ahead and get started. And uh, um, let me start by saying there's, there's one part of the OS we saw that users interact with all the time. You see this, this screen, this layout on a regular basis. I, I, I don't have statistics, but you're probably doing it at least once an hour, if not almost every five minutes or so. I mean, so that is the lock screen. So we're, what we're proposing is a project called Live Lock Screen. Now, we took a look at the standard lock screen and said, well, what, what, what can we do with it? Well, we need to understand how it works and what's, a, well, what's the problem with it and so forth. So, First thing, it's functional. So that's, that's not a downside, that's a plus. It's functional, it serves a purpose. You've got your time, you've got notifications, you've got stuff that's important to you. So it has that for it, but it's static, right? You turn it on, you see the same screen every time. You see your clock, you see the same image. Um, with CyanogenMod, we did allow the user to change the lock screen wallpaper, but again, you're seeing that same lock screen wallpaper every time you turn your screen on until you go in and change that. So it's always the same. Um, and to us, that's boring. Like, we're all about customization and personalization, and we want to bring that to the lock screen. We want, when you turn that phone on, we want you to at least enjoy that, even if it's for a brief moment. Like, it should be fun. It should be entertaining. It should be lively. So this is where we come up with a live lock screen. It still has to be functional. That's, that's, there's no doubt about that, right? We still have to provide a lot of the information that you see on your normal lock screen. We're, we're accustomed to that. But it doesn't have to just stay at that point. We want it to be dynamic. It can be lively. Like the, the idea is the lock screen comes to life. It becomes something more than just that screen that you see when you turn your phone on. And with this, the customization, it's really limited by the theme designer's imagination. I mean, we're trying to make this so that it's as open as possible so that these guys can create some awesome content. And so when you, every time you turn your screen on, we want it to be fresh and fun. And depending on how they implement these, their lock screens, it can be different every time that you turn it on. It doesn't have to stay the same. So we're trying to go from what's on the left here to something that's on the right, where we've got vivid colors, we're going to have animations, we've got time, we've got stuff that we need to see, but it's going to be in a way that we enjoy looking at it. So when we were looking at the live lock screen, we were looking at a lot of different technologies. How can we do this? And we need to keep in mind who's our user in this case for making a live lock screen. Well, that's theme designers. That's guys that have done stuff like this, but they're not necessarily coders. They don't write code but they might have done something that's similar code, or that is coding, that is Flash and ActionScript. So a lot of the stuff we did, we actually went with a web view, and we're using a lot of frameworks and projects that have been standardized and provide syntax similar to ActionScript. So we want guys that are doing maybe Flash animations and stuff like that on webs to be able to just jump right in. The barrier to entry, we wanted it to be very small. So, the reason we went with, WebG, uh, with a web view is because we can use WebGL, we can use a canvas that's WebGL backed, we can use all these existing libraries that are Flash-like but not Flash because Flash is dead. Um, and just in case the hardware doesn't support it, this is also going to use a canvas for a WebGL, or I'm sorry, HTML5 canvas. So it's a normal canvas if the device doesn't support it. But if it does, it's going to be harder accelerated. And most of our demos, we're doing 60 frames per second. And once I show it, I mean, it's pretty awesome that we can do that. 
Uh, one thing is, though, it needs to be sandboxed. It's a lock screen, right? We don't want to open up a security hole where somebody can access your information or they can access the internet, right? So even though it's a web view, there's no internet permissions. We've kept the permissions down to the bare minimum to facilitate what we need to do for a lock screen without compromising the security. Um, so we were able to achieve this because Android, in l newer versions of Android, they introduced the JavaScript interface API. This basically allows us to say, hey, we want to allow these methods to have access in JavaScript, but nothing else. So we can actually lock this down and say, give them the APIs that we want them to have, and just that. Um, there was a time in Android where somebody could actually cleverly do some JavaScript and get into any other class in Android that they wanted access to, and that was bad. So that's where the JavaScript interface came into place. So we, we, we make use of that. And we use it for things like um, creating unlock methods. So it's a lock screen. They're going to have to unlock it. But the uh, way they unlock it is still it's up to the theme designer. So it could be swipe left to right, draw a circle, do, push a button. Who knows what that is? And so they just once the user performs that action, they can unlock it. They can also unlock to common apps like MMS, browser, phone, your camera, things that you're used to getting to from your lock screen. Um, in addition to that, we provide some of the basic uh, data to, that, to the JavaScript side. We have the time, the date. Now, the time and date, they're formatted in the locale for the user, so we return a string that's already in the format that they need. If you have a 24-hour clock, you're going to see a 24-hour clock on your screen, even if it's the live lock screen. And if you're in a different locale, different language, it's going to be formatted in that format. Um, and then we have things like battery level, battery charging, so you can get status like that. So the theme could show different animations based on battery level. Um, they can get things like missed calls, and so they should go different text. Maybe a little bird flies in and says you have missed tweets, something like that. Um, so because it's a dynamic lock screen, we need to have data that's dynamic. It needs to have some way to be able to uh, create this different contact on the fly that changes with time, date, um, weather. So some of those things, like I said, there's battery and uh, state and level. But there's also we provide weather. So we can give the, the JavaScript side, here's the weather, format in text, gives them the, the the condition, the city they're in. But we also have some constants to find. We're using a, a Yahoo API right now for the weather. And so there's all these different constants that say what type of weather it is. It's a thunderstorm. It's snowing outside. The theme could potentially use that information and change the, the, what they're showing you on the screen. So if it's thunderstorm and lightning, you could have some animation of lightning going on. And maybe you have to swipe the light, lightning bolt away or something like that. But I mean, it provides a lot more uh, dynamic interface. Uh, time of day. Uh, one thing we added in, this was, we actually found this gem. Uh, Steve, our CTO, found this in one of his projects he did. There's this thing called the Twilight Service. Now, it's unfortunately not open up to application developers. But what this does is it takes the user's geolocation and time of day, and it can tell us when the sunset is, when tomorrow's sunrise is, and stuff like that. So we provided APIs that the lock screen can use this stuff. So if you can know when the sun's going to be setting. So if you want to show a night scene, you will know, hey, it's past sunset. So I can go ahead and show the night scene. If sun is rising, you could show an animation. Maybe the sun's starting to come up on your screen as you turn it on, stuff like that. Um, we also have location. It's generic. It's just uh, geolocation. So if somebody wanted to act on a, on a specific lat long to show something, we provide that. And then in addition to that, since you're locked screen, we want to show things like missed calls, mixed text, uh, sorry, unread text messages, unread emails. So we have APIs for that. They can't read those messages. They can't read the emails or anything. We're just providing the, those numbers to let them know, hey, this is what, how many unread emails this guy has. So if you want to display some UI with that, go ahead. All right. So one of the things we didn't want to do, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to use things that were already out there in the industry that have been proven and they're very popular, robust, and that also fit the criteria. We wanted something that was Flash or ActionScript-esque so people would be able to use it quickly. So some of the technology we came up, we ended up implementing, whereas uh, we have Pixie.js, which is a graphic framework. It's supposed to be the fastest kid in town, so we went with that one. Uh, there's a couple APIs from this green sock that provide animation. So we have a tween li uh, library and an ease pack that provide smooth animations, and it can also change the rate of the animations to make them nice and smooth and provide a, a much better visual experience. And then because some lock screens may want to do sounds, we brought in this buzz library, which also facilitates plain HTML sounds without them having to do the work of adding an, an uh, HTML5 audio element. So it's, it's all been abstracted and really easy to use. So real quick, I'm going to go over some of these. Um, so Pixie.js, like I said, it's, they say they're the fastest kid in town. And so far from the stuff that we've been doing with these live lock screens, they are, we're getting 60 frames per second. So these things are really fast. And it's being rendered on OpenGL. So there's a lot you can do on the GPU. Uh, 
They provide multi-touch, so all that's available via the JavaScript, so you can do touch events. You'll be able to do single, multi, whatever you want to do. Where they also have a thing called web fil GL filters. These are basically what, we, what are known as GPU shaders, so they can change the way the images are being drawn on the screen, maybe make something look pixelated. They have filters for that. They have one that makes it look like newspaper print. So you can apply these right on the fly without just a couple lines of code and make it change. Uh, they provide tinting and blending, so you can do all the things you're used to with graphics, fading stuff in and out, blending things together with different colors, tinting them. Uh, there's a sprite sheet support, so I don't know if you guys are familiar, not everybody's familiar with sprites, but it's common in 2D video games where you can have a whole set of animations that define the different cells for that animation, so maybe a character running across the screen. That's all loaded in one image called a sprite sheet, and Pixie allows you to load that kind of stuff up. Um, it does it via this asset loader, which does it in the background, so the lock screen can do other code while images are loading, so they don't have to waste cycles just spinning around waiting for stuff. And of course, it supports text, and text can be your own fonts, system fonts, and bitmap fonts. So some, sometimes you may not want a font to just be flat or just colored or maybe shaded. You want more texture to it. So you could provide a whole bitmap that's got all the different letters in it, and Pixie will actually draw your text using that uh, mapping of letters. So, so, like I said, we have a couple APIs from GreenSox. We use Tween Light and Eastpack, and this provides nice, smooth animation, similar to what Android does as well when you're doing application development. Tween Light, uh, it basically takes a couple properties, and it'll tween them from an object. So say you have an object XY, it'll move it to this new position, and you give it a time, and it'll do that transition for you. All you do is say, hey, I want you to go from here to here in this time, and it performs the animation without you having to do any other work. Um, this works in conjunction with Eastpack, which actually provides ways for that animation to be smoothed out a lot better. So instead of being linear and just quickly moving from one spot to the other, it can ramp up its speed, it can bounce, it can stretch, it can do stuff that makes the animation a lot more lively and stuff that we're used to in real life. Because things don't just move and then stop at a position, they usually slow down. So Eastpack helps uh, make that easier for the theme designer. And then Buzz, like I said, that plays sounds. It's a really easy API to use. I, I was uh, reviewing a couple other ones, and this one was like the simplest out of all of them. It, it provides basic functionality. You can load AUGs, waves, MP3s, AACs, um, and as well as control all the plane of it. So you can loop it, you can pause it, you can stop, you can mute it, you can fade in the volume, control it, set it to a specific value. So it, it provides a lot of stuff that you're going to need for, for something like this, and it's easy to use. So with that said, um, this is in early stages, but I'm going to go ahead and demo this. It's like, this is the first time we get to show this off. I'm, this is really what lock screens shines, because slides can only say so much. So, the visor will come back up again. OK. So I've got a few little live lock screens here that I've done. Um, when I was trying to do a proof of concept for this, I came up with a little demo. I'm not Dave Cover. I can't draw. I'm an engineer. I write code. I can't do anything. But I realized I can do rectangles. And I can do rectangles really, really good. And not only can I do rectangles really good, but I realized if I put these rectangles in a certain way, I can make it look like a city. So I've got this little cityscape lock screen, and I can swipe on it. It'll move. It's got like this little pop-up book look and feel. You know, and I can swipe, and it'll animate back on when I let my finger go. That's using tween light. Okay. So this is the first demo. So this is mine. This looks really like an engineer did it. What can I say? And then I can unlock just like a normal lock screen. Uh, the next demo I came up with, uh, Pixie.js actually had a demo of using those WebGL filters that I mentioned and the tinting and stuff. So I took their concept and turned it into a live lock screen. Their concept was this little fish pond. It was like a cartoonish little fish pond. Like the, I think I had that slide of it for you guys. I made it a lock screen, and so we get this. So now we have something that's vibrant and actually animating. So you see a lot of motion on there, but you still get some information, right? So I still got my clock, but it's, it's fun to play with. And as I swipe my finger down, it'll actually distort more. So you get that little distortion effect going. And I was using their WebGL filters. It was a displacement effect. So I can play around with that and tweak it, and then when I unlock, it'll go out. So there's that one. Now. We've been playing with this internally. A couple weeks ago, we've actually put this in our internal dog food builds where we test our stuff internally. And a lot of the engineers there are getting excited about it. And they're trying to come up with stuff too. And one of our engineers, Dinesh, um, he found one that was actually a demo by the guy that wrote Pixie.js. And it was done a couple years ago. So it was actually using an older version of Pixie.js. But he ended up getting it 
running on a live lock screen. This one's actually really fun. So what we have here is one of those party poppers, you know, where you actually pull them apart and you get confetti blown out. So he found this, and it, as I move my finger, you can see it'll stretch. It's got the rope effect and stuff like that. Now, when I swipe all the way away, so every time you I mean, it, it's just one of those things, it's, it's fun. Like, you're interacting with your phone. You might as well have some fun with it, since that's the part you're going to see every day. All right. So the last demo is a little bit of a two-parter. This is something that I cooked up a couple weekends ago. And so this is a social media where we're playing around with maybe providing a way API for to get social media images and stuff like that onto your lock screen. So this demo is actually going to use uh, Instagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in a hashtag and I'm going to go, I think it's, what's my tag? B-A-B-B-Q-15. All right, so I'm going to enter B-A-B-B-Q-15. I'm going to say fetch. Hopefully my internet's working. Now I'm going to switch over to the social media gallery lock screen. And if all goes well, hey, is that you? No, okay. I thought that was Ray. So, so as we go, it's just fetching a few. It pulls in the most 20 recent hashtags for that particular tag that I entered. And you're able to see those images actually flashing. And you know, I, can, I can swipe this up. I'll let it go. There's that bounce. So that's using those animations again. So this one's still early. We're still playing with this one, but it it's, it's shows the potential of how you can have a lock screen. So now not only do you have animations, but you have different backgrounds every time you turn your screen on, and it can change throughout the day. Hey, I know that guy. Awesome. So I do believe. Demo gods are with us this time. So that concludes our presentation. Um, we have some time, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to.